Welcome to Global Pride. I'm Todrick Hall. Global Pride is a historic Pride event that gives us the ability, the energy, and the excitement to celebrate each other and ourselves. Pride is, and always has been, a resistance. While we are decades removed from the Stonewall riots, we still have so much farther to go. We have overcome so much. There is so much to celebrate in that regard. Our present, we must remember to use our voices to demand justice and equality for everybody. Our society needs to look at diversity with a lens of intersectionality. When we stand in solidarity with one another, when we stand up for one another, that there's nothing that we can't accomplish. We stand united on a global stage. We create space to advocate, educate, and celebrate. Pride isn't just about the party, it's about the people. It's about the youth in our community, our seniors, trans and gender non-conforming friends and neighbors, people of color, the disabled, immunocompromised, the homeless, our veterans, and those raising families. We are all on this road together. Happy Pride. Welcome to the Commonwealth Club on this wonderful Thursday. Uh, this is our latest in more than a 100 online-only programs we have done since we've all started sheltering in place and uh, learning to binge-watch TV. Um, today's program, we've got a great program with 
the Warriors, Rick Welts, and the 49ers, Hannah Gordon. We're going to have a very fun conversation. Um, I'm John Zipper. I'm the Commonwealth Club's Vice President of Media and Editorial, and I have the fun job of co-hosting programs with Michelle Miao, who is, besides being a member of the Commonwealth Club's Board of Governors, she's also the host and producer of The Michelle Miao Show. So we thank you for joining us. You can find more of our upcoming programs as well as video and audio from our past programs at commonwealthclub.org slash online. Uh, I want to thank our sponsors for today's program for making this possible. It is Comcast and Gilead. We thank you very much for your generosity. And now, welcome, Michelle. Good to see you again. Welcome. Welcome. It's not just a, a Thursday, John. It's a Pride Thursday it's a happy Pride Thursday. I'm so excited to be here. And if you enjoyed that video, the very beginning in which we played of Global Pride, Commonwealth Club of California is the official live stream partner of Global Pride. So join us Friday night. We go live uh, for to- 24 or maybe t- over 24 hours. Over 500 Pride organizations around the world uh, have submitted content, world leaders, A-list talent. You saw there, Todrick Hall, Laverne Cox. So although it's a different pride this year, I know that, you know, we still have opportunities to be together and to be seen, and we should be seen. So happy pride. And now I'm very excited to introduce to you two folks who uh, have made, you know, great change and impact in their industries, and, and I would say an industry that that needs it. So we're very lucky to be having them and celebrating them during this Pride season. We have Rick Welts, who became a member of the Basketball Hall of Fame in 2018. For the past eight years, he has been president and chief operating officer of the Golden State Warriors, overseeing all business-related operations for the team, including the new Chase Center and Thrive City in San Francisco. In 2011, he publicly announced that he was gay in a front-page New York Times story. Wow, that's brave. (laughs) (laughs) For his work on diversity and inclusion in sports, he has been honored with the United States Tennis Association 2011 Icon Award, the Glisten Respect Award, the Glad Davison Valentini Award, the Anti-Defamation League's Torch of Liberty Award, and he was the Celebrity Grand Marshal of the San Francisco Pride Parade in 2015. We also have Hannah Gordon, who's the Chief Administrative Officer and General Counsel for the San Francisco 49ers. She oversees legal, public affairs, and strategic communications, risk management, community relations, the 49ers Foundation, fan engagement, and the 49ers Museum. She is also the Secretary of the Bay Area Host Committee and has been involved with events such as Super Bowl 50, WrestleMania 31, Beyonce's Formation World Tour, the Copa America Centenario, and the 2019 College Football Playoff National Championship. She's also active on league-wide matters and has served on multiple intra-league working groups. Let's welcome Rick and Hannah to our special program. Happy Pride to you both. Happy Pride to you, Michelle and John. Good to see you, Hannah. Yeah. Yeah. Happy Pride. Yeah. So, you know, Rick, you've you've uh, shared your coming out story, obviously, <laughs> to, to the world in a big major way. And we're going to touch on that while it, it is normally traditional here. And we ask all our guests for the coming out. I think uh, we'll start with, you know, that first day on the job. Not very many people get to work for, you know, the NBA or the NFL. And so, you know, Rick, we'll start with you. What was it like you uh, you you a ball boy at 16 years old for the Supersonics? Uh, I actually have vivid memories of that that day. It was, uh, you know, I was walking into the Seattle Supersonics locker room. These have been my heroes. I, I, you know, watched the team from its inception, and uh, it was thrilling. Right? I was I was walking into a place I never thought I'd have a chance to be in an industry and in sports that I always dreamed of being a part of. And I, I did learn a lesson that day. I will tell you that the uh, the two players who went out of their way to like even acknowledge my existence or maybe even be nice to me. Uh, two players, my name Lenny Wilkins and Rod Thorne. And out of all the people that were a part of that team, those two went on to be by far uh, the most sex- successful in their careers of, of anyone uh, that I knew in that organization. Lenny Wilkins inducted three times into the Basketball Hall of Fame as a coach, a player, and a coach of the Dream Team. And Rod Thorne, who actually was one of uh, the inductees that came in along with me in uh, 2018 to the Hall of Fame. So it taught me a lesson about how you treat people who, you know, don't necessarily have a great impact on your life 
and how it, you know it, what it represents in terms of your character. And, I, and last thing I would say is, you know, it's kind of a punchline joke that I started as a ball boy, but I will tell you, every day uh, of my career, I use the experiences that I had there because where people in my seat don't have the opportunity to be invisible in a context of players and coaches and media and owners and getting to see how all that happens behind closed doors. Th those dynamics really haven't changed uh, since that time. And, and I had a kind of an unusual education in my industry by, by just being a fly on the wall in that environment. That's so awesome. And then Hannah, I, this is special because I think the per perception is not very many women, you know, uh, uh, get to, to go as high as you have, let's, you know, uh, in the NFL. But let's start with the first day on the job. And I, I would assume that maybe that position was, were not the ones that I've listed here. That's correct. Um, so, so I was not a ball boy. But like Rick, I think my first job in sports is something that I still use to this day, which is I was um, the first female football beat writer for UCLA's Daily Bruin. And so my first day covering football, I remember our defensive coordinator sat down next to me on the bench as I was watching practice. And he said, which of the players are you dating? And he didn't say which player. He said, which of the players? <laughs> um, and at first I was very confused. <laughs> I was like, none of them. I'm the writer for the student paper. And he said, oh, I know which of the players are you dating? <laughs> and I said, okay, now I understand. Um, this is not going to go exactly how I planned. Um, but it was funny because then at the, by the time I was done covering the team two years later, he was completely accustomed to me being there. Um, we had a wonderful relationship. The last time I think I interviewed him, he actually was tying his tie in the locker room after a game and he walks into the showers to see the mirror to tie his tie. And I'm like trying to interview him. And I said, coach, no, I'm trying. And he said, just come in here. There's nobody in here. And I said, I'm allowed in the locker room. I don't think I'm allowed in the shower. <laughs> it's like, I'm going to need you to finish tying your tie. Um, so that was my, uh, my first day um, on the job. But it, it was a wonderful job that still informs everything I do in terms of you learn to, um, to do what you're doing, you learn to talk to people all the time. And at the end of the day, our jobs are all about people, especially in sports. And before each of you started in these positions, did you know you wanted to be in sports? And did you, you know, hope to have a career in, in professional sports? Or was it just you were interested in sports and this was something you started doing? Hannah? Uh, Hannah? Oh, sorry. Oh, me first. Okay. Yeah, um, yeah, I actually, I did. Um, I had fallen in love with sports and I, when I started at the paper, it was my hope that that was going to be um, something that I would end up liking. And I fell in love with it and never left the industry. For me in, in my household, sports was kind of what we were all interested in. And, and it was really the currency of communication between me and my dad that we went to games together. That's when we had our alone time. That's when we had our conversations. And I, I fell in love with the games that were going on. But I, I tell for me, it was a little bit different. I think I more was captivated by what I saw going on in the stands. When I saw, you know, in Seattle, when I saw 14,000 people who had a, absolutely nothing in common getting together to because of their mutual interest in this one thing and what it meant to our community. It was the first professional sports franchise in Seattle. And, and to me, I think the connection of the importance we can play in the culture uh, of a community is really what drew me to the industry. That's so, so awesome. Um, I'll stay with you, Rick, in this question, just because you brought up, we brought up, you know, the fact that you started off as a ball, uh, ball boy for the Supersonics. That was 1969. So the year of the Stonewall riots and just wondering if you have any memories or recollections of that year um, or what was happening, what was happening with the gay liberation movement. You know, I was 16 years old um, and I was at a place where I, I knew I was different that I hadn't reconciled with myself that this was going to be my sexual orientation forever. Um, so I would say I was interested, but in some ways I was disconnected. You know, the Macklemore song that talks about uh, those people that have certain characteristics uh, as a stereotype. Um, I was guilty of that. Like I, the people that I saw who were involved in that movement, I, I couldn't relate to. It didn't seem like me. It was, it was, 
I wasn't like that. I didn't think so that that was part, you know, my, my love of sports didn't fit the stereotype, things like that. So I, I was always really interested whenever a story would come on or whenever I could hear the word gay, but I, it just didn't feel like it was me yet. So I don't, you know, those are more impressions and memories, but that's kind of what I remember of that time. Um, I mean, talking about LGBTQ issues and sports and especially professional sports so often you're talking about, you know, for years, we've always considered them to be completely separate worlds. And now it, it there's just been a, a steady increase in the number of, of, uh, we interviewed a college basketball coach who recently came out, uh, you know, soccer players, uh, uh, various other athletes in a number of different leagues and, and, and type, um, do you think there's been a, I mean, it, both of you really from seeing the insides of how teams work and such, has there been an attitude change within teams as there maybe has also in the wider society or has, have those attitudes kind of always been there and, and just kind of waiting for this to break out? Does that make sense? Rick, I don't know if you want to go first. I mean, I know in football, I think people stereotype us in a lot of ways as yeah. perhaps um, non-gay friendly sport. And I hope that people get to see that changing. I think that within locker rooms, it people's outside perception is very different than what it's been inside. Like we've had, you know, before I was there, players who were out within the locker room, but maybe weren't talking about it publicly because it's very different to talk about your life with your coworkers than it is to go out and talk to the media about it and who felt accepted. Um, and I, and we actually just had a panel on Monday um, of one of our coaches who's gay, um, former NFL player who's gay, an ally, and then one of our broadcasters who's gay. Um, and they were talking about their experiences in football and it, you know, not always being a welcoming environment, but sometimes more due to fears around family or um, things that coaches said more than teammates. Um, and I do want to acknowledge, I think for us as an organization, we had a really painful point in 2012 where one of our players um, during an interview, we went to the Super Bowl. And during the interview, there was a shock jock, um, which is, you know, sort of a, a genre that I really dislike for a lot of reasons that is a particularly homophobic, racist and sexist genre of media um, who came up to him. And the first question he asked him, because a lot of this got lost in, in the storytelling was and it was a black player. He said, how many white girls are you going to bang this week? At Super Bowl. And it was such a, a racist, sexist question. And he continued to badger the player and then essentially put the player in a position to, quote, you know, defend his masculinity. And when the player said none, um, he said, oh, well, how many guys are you going to bang this week then? And that's when the player said um, something that was very ignorant around, oh, we don't have any of that sweet stuff in our locker room. Um, and the player deeply regretted what he said um, and was somebody who had gay family members who, who didn't have, you know, hate or fear in his heart. But I think it was really illuminating not only for him, but for our whole team around having conversations about A, how hurtful comments like that are, um, and B, that that saying something that's ignorant, even if you don't think that you have hate in your heart, what you are supporting is hate and is fear. Um, and so I think it was a real, it was a painful, but really necessary lesson for all of us. Um, and, and something that certainly the young man learned a lot from, but it also, for me, the way that interview came up, a reminder of how intersectional, um, all of these issues are, um, and that, especially in the time that we're living in, I think it's important for us to keep in mind that, you know, sexism, homophobia, racism, these are all interrelated um, concepts um, that are used to oppress people. And so we have such an opportunity when we all come together to address them um, collectively, understanding our differences, but collectively. Rick. Uh, you know, I, I think first thing is the obvious that men's professional sports still has a long way to go. Uh, and we have made some progress. I think I think we've set the right tone in terms of what our league has done. I, I'm proud of what the NBA has done and the stance that they've taken. Uh, you know, I never imagined uh, 
in 2011 that I would get to ride in the New York City Gay Pride Parade in an NBA float with the commissioner uh, of the National Basketball Association. That's not something I would have envisioned, but I think from the top of the organization, uh, we've kind of set the ground rules on what's acceptable and what's not acceptable and what we believe in. It's another, you know, it's always a question I get asked. I'm sure Hannah does too, like, you know, when's the next athlete coming out? And it's such a complicated uh, question because, you know, it, it, we just, we forget that we're dealing with 20 somethings, uh, young people actually with limited life experience because they've been such an incredible athlete from the time they stepped on a field for the first time that their experience is different than most of us. Um, in our league, you have about four years on average to uh, earn a living in the one thing that you've been better at than than anything else and the one, only thing you've focused on, focused on as a profession. Uh, that's your limited earning time. Uh, and the players that I talk to, you know, in, in asking like what the boundaries are here, um, I hear more that there's, there is not concern that their teammates wouldn't accept them or their organizations wouldn't accept them. Uh, but what we do is, a, is to create a winning atmosphere is an incredibly delicate balance. And, you know, the best thoughts that I've heard from players are, you know, I can understand why a player would not want to bring this overwhelming attention on him into that locker room at a time where that chemistry is so difficult to achieve. And it just, it could be just potentially very, very disruptive to what the player wants to accomplish as a teammate uh, and, and being part of a winning culture. So, you know, I, I, I think it could happen tomorrow uh, in our league, but it, it hasn't happened since Jason Collins came out. And it's not because we don't have gay players in our league. It's just because they haven't reached a point where they feel personally the comfort that taking that step is uh, what they want to do. Uh, Hannah, you, you mentioned something about the intersectionality and all these all of these things coming together. And I just kind of wanted to get at, obviously, we're at a time of, besides COVID, besides an economic collapse, <laughs> of massive demonstrations. And, and where I'm going is, um, I mean, we're seeing NASCAR banning, you know, the, the Confederate battle flag. We're seeing uh, the, was it the Mississippi Southern Baptist Convention uh, saying, yes, take down, take that flag, you know, change the state's flag to get rid of the rebel flag. I mean, we're seeing real, we're seeing organizations that you would not normally expect to come out and make forthright, you know, public stands on things that are doing it. And yeah. um, it, it, to me, it seems like we're at a moment where this is, seems very, very different from uh, the Ferguson uh, marches and, and, you know, other things from within a, you know, a large organization and large league, do you see that as well? Oh, absolutely. And I think what you're talking about is the result, not only of people physically protesting in the streets, but it's people using their economic power um, through their purchasing power to force corporations and brands to be more responsive to their values. Um, and so, and I think that that's really positive. I think that's exciting. And I think that young people are demanding that of us. Um, so I think it's really, it's wonderful. And we've had a lot of conversations. I mean, we have players who've been very active, um, in this space and that's been exciting to see them engage in that way. Cause as Rick said, you know, players for the most part, um, are usually in their twenties, right? So they're like every other young person who's experiencing what's happening right now. Um, and they have a very big platform, but they're also still coming into their own, right. As sort of civically engaged citizens, um, and just like any 20 something is. Um, and so that's been really cool to see for sure. And, and I think to your point around the intersectionality, um, it, it's been exciting to see as well in the midst of all this, the Supreme Court's decision. Um, and I think that there is, I certainly hope that for, you know, straight women like me, that we understand that with a decision like that, the whole purpose is like Title VII of the Civil Rights Act, applying, you know, no discrimination on the basis of sex to individuals who are transgender on the basis of sexual orientation, gender expression, that hopefully we can understand that my experience as a woman in sports is necessarily related to the experience of a gay man in sports, is, ex is related to the experience of a gay woman in sports, is related to a transgender person's experience, because all of it is around 
how do we allow people to express who they are and how do we, how does the system, right. Attempt to control our bodies, control who we have sex with control, um, as a result, our mind and our, and our spirit and our hearts. Um, and so I think that, that this is a really exciting time. Um, and I'm glad that we're living in it, even if it's a little bit of a difficult time, um, for a lot of reasons. This is such a great conversation. If you're joining us live, uh, get engaged, ask us questions. John's going to be monitoring the chat. So, um, send in your questions or your comments and we'll get them to Rick and Hannah, uh, you know, Rick, you mentioned Commissioner David Stern, and sadly we lost him this year. But uh, every time I read that New York Times article in which you come out, you know, they talk about that moment uh, you lost your partner to HIV AIDS, and uh, you get, you know, you're, you get a phone call, and you're bawling, and um, the phone call is from Uncle Dave, and, and uh, da- David Stern served as such a, a, you know, a comfort to you at this time of tragedy and vulnerability and so you know question although I bring up Commissioner David Stern and to Hannah you can follow Rick on this but it's really about how the league the association that there there is a family aspect to it and that when you are able to create space that's safe especially for LGBTQI people um, that you know that there all of that is also a part of not just, you know, being football or being uh, basketball, but so we'll start with Rick, you know, just telling the story, talking about that story, being a part of a, a family and ha- the importance of creating space that is safe for everyone. Well, for me, uh, I lost my partner in 1994 in New York City, um, and I was not out at the time at the NBA. I, in my choice, I mean, I had really constructed, I would say, some walls around me that people respected. I was never asked if I was gay, but I never, you know, and I never tried to take a female to a, to a party at the NBA to try to throw somebody off the track, but I, but I, but I wasn't out. And, uh, you know, uh, Arnie played tennis on a Saturday. Um, and when in came, I came home actually from working for a little while and found him unresponsive on the bed and got him to NYU hospital and he died the following Wednesday. It happened that fast. Um, that Monday morning, I had to go into the office. There was nobody at the office I could talk to about this. So I went in, uh, Stern walked by my office. How you doing? I said, well, you know, I, I've got uh, somebody I'm really responsible for who's in the hospital and going to need to take a little time. And he nodded and said, of course, go do what you need to do. Um, you know, we we were both from Seattle, Washington. So I, I took... Uh, Arnie's ashes back to Seattle. Uh, I wanted to have a memorial service there for friends and family. Uh, I ran one ad back when newspapers were the thing in the, in the local Seattle paper suggesting if somebody wanted to donate to a, uh, to a scholarship fund in Arnie's name, uh, here's how to do it. And on the way back from that, back to go back to New York, I picked up a stack of envelopes that were in a post office box and, you know, very gratifying to see people who wanted to reach out and recognize. I got to one envelope that that said Scarsdale, New York. I'm like, how would anybody in Scarsdale, New York, have any idea about that this even happened? And I opened up the the envelope, and it was a ten thousand dollar check from David and Diane Stern. No explanation. So, you know, when I got back in the office, I felt compelled to to go back. Uh, and acknowledge it. And I kind of walked in and we were so stupid. I wish I could recreate them. It was kind of like, you know, I wanted to think, yeah, 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 yeah. Okay. Yeah. 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 Guy thing. Guy thing. Guy, <laughs> hey, you know, on to the next thing. Uh, but it was his way. It was his way of saying, I know, I know what happened to you. Um, it's okay. I'm here to support you, but we never had the conversation you know, until years and years later. Um, and, and I had still to this day have no idea how he knew any of that had happened. So uh, it told me everything I needed to know about the organization I was working in and, and the man who was leading. Thank you for sharing. And so um, that's just so special. Thanks for sharing that with us today. Uh, so Hannah, and as I understand it, you started the first pride for the San Francisco 49ers. And so it kind of, you know, dovetails Rick's story about creating, being part of a family and knowing the importance of something like pride. So you talk a little bit about that. Yeah, 
it's really hard to follow Rick. <laughs> I'm going to say first. Um, and also, so I remember that New York times story, um, 2011 isn't that long ago, but we did still get physical papers at the NFL league offices, which is where I was working when it came out. And I remember I read that story and I just thought, wow, Rick Waltz is like the most amazing man and executive. And I, and I actually thought I was like, I hope I would get to meet him someday. <laughs> um, so it's been extremely gratifying um, <laughs> to, to get to um, meet Rick a few times now that we're both in the Bay area. Um and it just is somebody I admire so much. And, and I mentioned uh, earlier that we did this um, 49ers Pride, which is our, our fan platform for the LGBTQ community and allies. We did an event on Monday. And one of the things that, um, that some of the players brought up was how important it is to have people in the front office who are gay. That they know that there are people like them who have risen to the top of organizations. And so I just, you know, Rick is such a hero to so many people for so many different reasons. But I think that it also, it just sends such an important message um, to athletes of all backgrounds. Um, and and also I wanted to touch just on sort of the, the historic aspect, you know, because we talked about Stonewall, which I was not around for, but I grew up in Oakland in the Bay Area. And as we're in this pandemic, um, my parents were commenting, like, I wonder how this is sort of hitting my niece and nephew. And it made me reflect on, you know, growing up in the Bay Area in the late 80s and early 1990s, in my elementary school, three of our elementary school teachers died of AIDS. Wow. All three were gay men, um, all two of whom were out um, and, and, and were beloved. Like they were, you know, two of the most beloved teachers in our elementary school. Um, and so as I was thinking about that and just thinking about their memories and also, you know, thinking about as a child, you know, they're grownups who are dying and that's horrible. Um, as an adult, realizing how young they actually were, because as a kid, age is, is so relative, um, it is even more heartbreaking than it was then. Um, and so I think it, you know, I noticed that like the program is, is in partnership with AIDS 2020. And I think that's really wonderful because I think it's also important that we don't forget all of these aspects of our history um, and all the people that we lost. Um, and so when you were speaking about family and, um, and like how we create those environments. I do think, you know, for us to be successful as sports teams, as organizations, people have to have psychological safety, right? They have to feel that it's a, not just a family, but a functional family. Um, Cause you know, plenty of people come from dysfunctional families um, and that's ideally not what you want in a sports team. Um, and so that means we do, people need to feel accepted and they need to feel like they can be their whole selves at work, um, whether they're an athlete or a non-athlete. Um, and and ideally, you know, it, at our team, we our sort of slogan for the business side is that we want to go one step further to make somebody feel a part of the 49ers family. And so as I thought about like who we are, um, it's so critical that our fans feel that they are wholly and completely accepted by us. And certainly as a result of what had happened in 2012, I was concerned that they might not feel that way. Um, and, and frankly, also, I, I saw that the Minnesota Vikings were making some really wonderful strides um, in some of the programming that they were doing, like one-off programming, actually as a result of uh, a settlement with Chris Cluey, who I went to college with, who was a very outspoken ally. Um, and I'm a very proud Bay Area native. And I felt like, wait a minute, we are the San Francisco 49ers. We have a proud history in the Bay Area of being at the forefront um, of the LGBTQ movement. And so we need to kind of claim our place, and our brand, um, and, and really be at the forefront. Um, and so that's when we started talking to folks within our own organization who identified as part of the community, folks outside the organization um, who are either advocates um, or otherwise involved in the community around how do we build a platform um, to connect fans too? Because, you know, if some fans know each other, some don't, and we want to build that community. Um, and so it launched um, and was really successful last year. We had a thousand people sign up in the first week and more than the numbers, it was the messages that we got from people. Um, you know, there people sent us videos crying, telling us, you know, they, that even though they never felt that they weren't accepted, like this felt like, not just that you're being tolerated, but that there was somebody with open arms saying like, I want to see you and identify with you and, um, and welcome you in. And so that was, was really awesome. And so this past fall, we did our first, um, away game watch party in the Castro. Um, and we had a drag queen halftime show. 
So it was like amazing, super awesome. Um, and then um, now obviously our programming is virtual right now, um, but we are still connecting. <laughs> Thanks, actually, for mentioning the AIDS 2020 conference. This huge international conference was going to happen both in San Francisco and Oakland this year, and they are now doing it all virtually, and, and as well as partnering on some programming such as today's. But let's get into what that means for you guys, because, of course, I assume we're talking to you from your homes. What, what are your work days like now, and how are your teams as organizations and as athletes – what are they all doing right now? What are they looking forward to do? What's different for them or what can they, what can they do? Unless everyone's staying at your houses. <laughs> Rick, you first. Sure. Uh, I really had no idea what to expect. I guess none of us did. And it's so different than what, um, what I thought it would be. We have about 550 full-time employees, uh, counting chase center and the warriors, uh, combined and, uh, you know, the day that we met, uh, the day before the shelter in place order came and we told everyone that we're going to be working at home for a while. Uh, I got to tell you, I, I was the biggest skeptic in terms of being able to disperse 500 people and actually be able to run uh, our business. I am a total convert. I'm so amazed at how well this works. I don't understand how I can be twice as busy as I've ever been in my entire life. Um, I'm probably also accomplishing next to nothing, but every day is filled doing just what we're doing now. We're, we're talking to, to people inside the organization. We're having our meetings. We're trying to figure out how we're going to get through all this. We're figuring out what the world's going to look like in the future. Um, it's, it's hard for the players because uh, our practice facility, which is part of Chase Center, was closed. Uh, there was no organized way to work out. Uh, Steph Curry actually had to build a basketball goal in his driveway, which I would have uh, really enjoyed seeing because I'm not sure he's the most handy with a tool belt. <laughs> uh, but uh, everyone had to kind of figure out what to do on their own. We have been now reopened for uh, a few weeks uh, with incredible protocols, uh, limited number of you know, players that could be in our practice facility at any time, no interaction between the players. They all have their own ball, their own equipment. Everything gets clean between every timed uh, interval that you have to work out. Very limited staff. Uh, we're going to be moving to a, a little more uh, basketball activity. We're not one of the 22 NBA teams that's going to Orlando to finish the season. Uh, as I said, I think before we started, we picked a really good year to suck, uh, <laughs> after five straight trips to the finals. So, uh, we're, we're, you know, every, everybody is focused. It's working incredibly well. I don't think it's a substitute in our industry for the face-to-face -face contact and creativity that comes from that. And just the, the, the relationship building that we get through having direct interaction to people. So I, I don't see it as a substitute, but it'll change the way we work forever. I'm, I'm convinced there's, there's a lot of things that we did out of necessity here that will now become much more standard uh, in terms of how we run the business. Hannah. Yeah. Um, well, first, let me apologize because I forgot to close the windows before we started because it's warm here and I forgot that I live in a flight path. So if you like occasionally <laughs> <laughs> flying over and somebody knocked on the door while Rick was answering a question, I was like, oh, this is the problem with working from home. Um, oh, there goes a the plane right now. Um, <laughs> so <laughs> I would say, you know, like Rick said, I think it has probably worked a lot better than I thought it was going to, which is good because it also lasted a lot longer than I thought it was going to. I think for those of us who are extroverts, it's very challenging. Um, but every introvert I know absolutely loves it, thinks it's the best <laughs> thing ever. Um, and I think it has changed the way that we work. But as Rick said, I don't think, especially obviously in our business, uh, it, it certainly does not replace in-person contact. And I think you know we were talking beforehand about pride and like, what I love about pride is you are out there with other human beings. Um, and that's what I love about sports too. Um, so I'll be very happy um, when it all returns. I wonder what were your pride plans before uh, COVID? I mean, did you, did you have a plan to ride on a float this year? Or? So we had our very first, um, it was really more of a truck than a float last year. We were a little late in our, our planning and I'm a perfectionist. So I was a little bit like, why don't we have the prettiest float? Um, but it was more like a giant flatbed truck that we were having a party on. Um, and it was really fun. And I was looking forward to this year. Um, so I am, I am sad. 
Yeah, it's okay. It's okay. Maybe maybe a truck or a float will drive by your house instead of the plane, a pride <laughs> one. But Rick, you know, I'm I'm such a I'm such an athlete. I think that the Warriors <laughs> get the the golden trophy every year just for being the Warriors. And so just uh you wondering, you know, if you had it, it did you have plans to come out on a float with the trophy again or um and also where are the trophies now? Uh, they're they're safely uh, uh, tucked away at Chase Center. We'll have, let you come down and, and touch one anytime you want to. <laughs> uh, but we're our uh, our diversity and inclusion council at the Warriors. Uh, you know, we had big plans this year. We we as a company certainly march in the parade. Um, I think this year we were going to join with Kaiser Permanente and and do something bigger than we've done in the past. But uh, you know, in the middle of March, in the middle of all that planning, we all had to realize we'd be doing something else uh, and marching in a parade. Mm. John? So, are you using this time to prepare for what it will be like when you actually start playing in games again or when you start getting back to, to uh, training camp in the NFL? Or is this, it, it sounded like a lot of what you was taking place was just kind of the, uh, you know, the kind of the back office stuff that could continue going. Is there a lot of planning ahead that's going on right now? Or or is it too many questions about, you know, is the coach going to be staying at home and, and calling in uh, uh, plays from a, an iPad or something? They'll hang in front of the, the players. <laughs> John's that is a new too. idea. I've definitely not heard yet. That would be great. <laughs> no, very creative. I, li- I like that you're thinking outside the box. Um, <laughs> yes, there, there's lots of planning happening, um, and it, it does take a lot of time. So even though we're at home, we have been we have been working quite a bit. I'm also realizing that I forgot when I brought up Pride to plug the fact that I have on our Pride shirt. Ah. And this is last year's. It's in white. We still have it in white. We also have it in black this year. Um, so just in case anybody wanted one, I'm still waiting for my black one to arrive in the mail. <laughs> um, I want to bring it back to, you know, just a, the, the conversation. I, I mean, the title of this program is about resilience. And I, I think we've been really upbeat and positive about, uh, you know, your, the impact that you've had and Hannah, the NFL, and uh, Rick, obviously the NBA, but um, I think big picture, it's not just the league or the association and the fans, but the world, you know, and when Katie Sowers came out, uh, or not came out, but it was, you know, she got the job and became the first out uh, lesbian coach in the NFL, it was such a big deal, even for a non-sports person like myself, that Yes, every single game thereafter, I was very much like, go Niners! I didn't even know what it happens when they score points and touchdown. <laughs> I know that now. But, um, yeah, no, I don't know. My, my, my sister, who's, who's a straight ally, also, she's like, oh, gosh, you're the most annoying person to watch football with. But, now, you know, but after, after Katie, I'm such a huge fan, right? And then the same with Rick. It's like hearing that the, the, an executive of a championship team is gay, like all this, this confidence. And that I also know that, you know, with that confidence comes overcoming some of the challenges. So if you could, it's pride season. We're always trying to make sure that the youths who follow you, who see you, who see the teammates, who see the players um, and the leaders in in your, your organizations uh, have some, something to look forward to. If you could just share a little bit, like what are some of the challenges, Hannah, you know, even as a woman being in the league, we were, we mentioned that earlier um, to it and then overcoming that and being resilient and trusting that being authentic and whole and who you are is, is worth it. Uh, we'll start with Rick. Well, uh, you know, I like to tell a story at like three years ago this month, uh, my now husband, uh, Todd, and I got invited to uh, the White House for Obama's last Pride celebration at the White House. And it was really thrilling uh, to be a part of. Um, and, you know, the atmosphere was incredibly, you know, upbeat and celebrating the accomplishments over his administration. But he gave a speech that I'll never forget that day because it was it was prophetic. Um you know, he, he was much more kind of somber in tone, I thought. And, and, and his message was, you know, look at all the things that have been accomplished uh, in the last eight years, but uh, please don't think this is over. 
like, please don't think this has been a mission accomplished because as quickly as we have progressed, that progress could be reversed just as quickly. And, you know, basically don't take your eye off the ball. This is, this is going to be on the agenda forevermore. And you guys have to be devoted to making sure that we continue to talk about this and continue to work toward a world where, where we're all accepted. And that was on a Thursday. Um, you know, the massacre in Orlando took place that Saturday at the Pulse nightclub. Um, and, you know, from just what the last uh, four years have been like uh, politically, where, you know, we've kind of at the top of our government uh, enabled hate to be a strategy, enabled putting dividing people as a, as a political strategy. Uh, I think of his words all the time, you know, what little role I can play maybe and all that and the challenge is I, I guess I knew what I signed up for when I did what I did and I hear from as I'm sure Hannah does a lot of people in our industry who uh, are, do not yet feel comfortable coming out but would like to talk to somebody who can kind of understand their stories and you know that that's helped me um, I, I'm honored that I get to do that um, but it's actually helped me a little bit we I don't know if you remember we as the NBA awarded Charlotte uh, an all-star game a few years ago. And shortly thereafter, uh, uh, a bill was passed in North Carolina called HB2, which was a very discriminatory bill uh, talking about gender assignment and restrooms. And it was, it was just blatantly uh, a terrible, terrible law. And the NBA had to decide what to do. Like, do we go to Charlotte and play an all-star game? And we had a board of governors meeting and, uh, in July in Las Vegas, I'll never forget. And Adam Adam Silver, our, our uh, commissioner, came to me before the meeting, said, I'm going to let you have kind of the last word in this discussion. And it was brought up. There was a lot of discussion about whether we should or what the impact would be on Charlotte and, you know, our team there and everything else. And it got to the end. And I could honestly look around the room at, at these owners of teams and say, look, I, I just ask one thing. It's like I'm in contact with a lot of people in your organization's who don't feel comfortable uh, in the atmosphere they're in and coming out and being their authentic selves. And I'd like you to think about those people when you're deciding what to do here, because they're watching you. And what you do here uh, will make a statement to them about what kind of organization you were. And, you know, fast forward in that voted not to go to Charlotte. Uh, the law was changed. We ended up going to Charlotte and became kind of a celebration of of diversity uh, that we built around that all-star game. So, you know, it's enabled me to, to have some kind of impact, uh, but it's a time to remember. I love what Hannah says. It's also a, really a time to remember those we've lost. Hmm. Thank you for As the word. Yeah. Really hard to follow. I'm like, can you make me answer the questions first? Because <laughs> <laughs> it's just impossible to follow. Um, so in terms of resilience, and I love what Rick just said about using um, our influence to create change, because I think, you know, what he did at that meeting is so powerful. And the fact that he was courageous enough to bring his authentic self and his own experience, then bettered the entire league. And I think that's such a lesson to all of us in what we are potentially losing as businesses, if we are not creating a safe space where everybody can bring their whole self and bring all of their opinions, because then we lose that opinion, then maybe we make the wrong decision. Um, so I think that that's really important. And, and as I've been thinking about resilience, you know, this month in which, you know, it's a time both for celebration and I, I loved the, um, the slogan they had on the Pride 2020, which was, I think, exist, persist, resist. Um, and I was reading Audre Lorde again recently, and she talks about um, we have to like for those of us who are different survival and may she forgive me in heaven if I misparaphrase her words, um, but survival is, we have to make our differences into our strengths um, because the master's tools will never dismantle the master's house. And we might be able to temporarily beat him at his own game, but that will never bring about real change. And, it, and she was speaking at a conference where they had not invited very many women of color. And she said in that, in the rest of that speech, that it is only those women who believe that their only source of support is the master's house to whom this is threatening. And I think that those words are so powerful and she wrote them more beautifully than I just paraphrased them. Of course, I should have quoted her directly um, because our strengths 
really are our differences. And we find this all the time in business and in life. And, and I think for all of us who have been in a position where we are somehow different from those around us, um, resilience really requires us to see that. And I know that for me early in my career, I just became very good at temporarily beating um, men at their own game. And, and oftentimes that was by mimicking men, which is something that historically women in male dominated environments have done forever, right? It's like, okay, I'm just going to be part of the boys club. I'm going to be the, I'm going to be the best at being one of the boys. And oftentimes that involves putting down women using lots of curse words. I still use lots of curse words, but that's, <laughs> but that's authentically myself. Um, and, um, <laughs> And I really had to see over time that that really is temporary because the game was actually set up for me to ultimately lose no matter what, if that was how I was going to play the game. Um, And so when we talk about resilience, I think I do take so much strength from knowing all those who have come before across all different experiences, um, having to to move past um, any type of oppressive system. And then secondly, I think you get that resilience from from within, um, including giving ourselves space to rest. And I think that's one of the things that's been an important thing that people have brought up this month as well is, um, is that it's exhausting to battle all the time, (laughs) um, or to be different all the time. And so we also have to give ourselves space, um, you know, for that mental health day and for that self care. Mm. Uh, Okay. Hannah, we'll give you a question. That's first before, before Rick comes and gives one. Um, so we, I mean, it, it, great strides have been made. Are there specific changes, whether it's in rules or new initiatives you'd like to see in the major league sports, whether it's MLB, NHL, NFL, uh, NBA, I mean, specific things that you would like to see them to do to be either more supportive or more welcoming or to, to, you know, lift discrimination, you know, situations and, and structural problems. Well, I think there's probably, when we talk about overall structural issues, how do we create a more diverse and inclusive work environment? What are the policies that we need to change? I think we saw last month, um, there were some important improvements to the Rooney rule um, to require diverse slate interviewing um, at the uh, sort of at the sea level of of the entire organization. I think things like that are good. Mm -hmm. Um, I do think that you know, there's, there's kind of two pieces, right. That are always moving, which is the policy side and then, um, culture. And I think what Rick touched on early in the conversation that was really important is that for a lot of people, it's not just what's happening in our organizations. It's how is the Twitter sphere going to react to this, right? How, how are these spaces where fans and other people are attacking people and, and using derogatory language? How do we change that in our culture? I think, you know, part of what you're asking it, it it ties to um, the challenges of systemic change, right? Because systems are everywhere and then we all participate in them and we all participate in recreating them. And so how do we look at those um, both from a policy perspective, but also from our individual behavior? Because I think sometimes when we focus just on policy, people don't take responsibility for their individual behavior enough. Um, So, I mean, I would certainly, what I, I would love to see every NFL team have an LGBTQ platform for their fans, as well as a, you know, internal engagement group or a diversity council or something of that nature. Um, but I'd also, I guess what I'd like to see isn't just policy change. What I'd really like to see is more different um, faces and experiences at every level um, of the organizations. And, and we've certainly made progress there, but we have a long way to go. Thank you. How about you, Rick? Uh, you know, on the business side, I'm always struck when we bring our, our 30 teams together and I look out in the audience and see, still see so many white males on the business side. It's just, it's, it's kind of a jarring image. Uh, you know, I, I think, um, I, if I, if I was commissioner, I mean, I don't think legislation for our league works as well as, as sharing best practices. We kind of have a, the NBA is a really interesting culture. We have a 35 person group who does nothing but collect best practices from the team, share them with all the teams. Um, we're hundred percent transparent on every bit of financial data. I know every dollar the Los Angeles Lakers are making in sponsorship and television and ticket sales. Um, it's, it's definitely that culture and where, where we can reward good behavior. The league has to lead, you know, I'm on the league's, uh, global, uh, diversity and inclusion council that covers all our offices all over the world. Uh, 
you know, I think, yes, just as I want every team to decide that uh, having their own DNI council is a, is a really smart thing for them to do. Um, and I'd like a lot, I, I'm not embarrassed to say I would like a lot of it to be that they finally understand, the teams completely embrace the idea that this is not only like the right thing to do, this is good for business. Like, you know, having having a bunch of people that look like me sitting around a table making decisions uh, isn't going to yield as good an outcome as people uh, with background, gender, uh, diversity, racial diversity, who who can come to the table with the, the same life experiences that our fans have and can better express uh, and get us to a place where, where, where we're making the, a better decision. It's good for business. It's, you know, I'm not going to apologize for that. Yeah. If you, if the only reason you can get your head around it is because you think it's the right thing to do. Okay. That's fine. But, but come around, we'll really have made progress when I think our organizations realize that, that it's a great business strategy in addition to being the right thing to do. So, um, I, I think we we're con- we continue to make real progress. We just have to keep the conversation going. One of the great things about what's happened the last four weeks is the amount of storytelling uh, on life experience that's gone on in our organizations. Uh, yes, a lot of it focused on Black employees, but not all of it. Like I, you know, I, I told my story at a town hall. Everybody has had a forum, an opportunity to, today. You know, every day we do one, one of our executives gets to author a daily update that's an essay about whatever they're thinking about that day and their own life experience. And it just connects people in a way that is so powerful. Like I know things about our employees right now that I never would have known if if George Floyd hadn't been murdered. Right. And, you know, I, I think I've learned a lot from that about how we should move forward and, and tell our stories. And it breaks down every barrier. It breaks down every concern when you actually know why people are the way they are and why they think the way they are. And it, it's a level of understanding that we just got to keep up. You know, it's terrible that it happened the way it happened. But I think it's one of the blessings that will come out of this in the long run. Wow, that is so great. Both of you, great answers. I would think that if uh, the commissioner seat was open, um, you know, for your respective organizations and both of you made that position, the uh, NBA, the NFL would would be very much safer and and much more inclusive. Uh, So I hope that that one day that, you know, I can call you, you know, Commissioner Gordon or Commissioner <laughs> Waltz. Um, but that's the that's the hope that you both give us, right? That a woman can be in that seat, a gay man can be in that seat, a person of color. Um, we've got about 11 minutes left, so if you, you're dying to ask Rick or Hannah a question or you want to comment, uh, now's your chance. Otherwise, I'm hogging the whole 11 <laughs> minutes that I have with these two wonderful human beings. Um, uh, y- so Pride is 50 years old. <laughs> the first Pride was 50 years ago, and, and it's, you know, there's conflicting reports. New York says they were the first one. L.A. says they were the first one. San Francisco says they were the first one. Well, here, I'll be the boss. All of you were the first, and it was important that you all were the first because it happened, you know, because of the Stonewall riots. But um, hearing you talk, like even just in your careers and looking back at history and LGBTQ rights and its history, a lot has changed. Um, but had Hannah had said, you know, there's still a whole lot of work that needs to be to be done. If you could uh, reflect on, um, you know, what the what maybe the near future. And this is a weird question because we're in a you know we're experiencing a pandemic. Like we don't know what tomorrow looks like. We don't know what next year looks like. Uh, But for folks who are at home and not with community, especially in the month of June, you know, um, just to your perspective of like, you know, it's going to be okay. Like from my perspective, it's it's absolutely going to be okay. We're going to do this pride season virtually. We're here together, connected virtually. And then next year, we're probably going to be sitting six feet apart or something like that. Uh, but but that's okay too because I could you know see still see and hear you. Um, so yeah, the floor is back to both of you. Uh, kind of some perspective on getting through this pandemic, uh, fifty years of pride, the next few years, and and celebrating each other. We'll start with Hannah because Hannah says she wants to go first from here on out. <laughs> this was a mistake. I know ne- I never should have said that. Um, 
Yeah, I mean, I think it's very cool when we think about how much has changed in the last 50 years. Um, you know, 50 years ago, marriage wasn't legal, right? 50 years ago, there were no transgender rights that were protected under the law. But I think to the point that Rick made about his visit to the Obama White House, how jealous am I also of this? Um, that story. Um, is that what we've also seen, unfortunately, in the same week as the Supreme Court decision were moves by the White House to take away transgender health rights. And so it's important, like he said, that as much as we celebrate the progress, that, that we recognize that unfortunately there are people who are trying to turn that back all the time. And so it requires our constant attention. Um, and then in terms of, yeah, how do we celebrate and how do we find community during this time? I mean, I think the great thing is you guys are creating community right here virtually um, with us. Um, and so, and right now that's kind of all we can do. Right. Um, and I, I hope that by next year, we don't have to be six feet apart, but this is the thing about life is unpredictable. Um, and there's so much that we can't know. And I think, you know, if I've learned anything during the last three months, it's to be so grateful for all the things that I was taking for granted. I took for granted that I got to hug people and shake their hands and I don't take that for granted anymore. Um, so, and, and I feel the same way about, about sports. Like I, I took for granted how joyful it is to be in a stadium full of screaming fans um, and that it was totally worth any traffic or any line that you had to wait in. Um, and I will never take that for granted again. That's great. Uh, you know, I'll, I'll tell another David Stern story, you know, back in when I got to the NBA in 1982, the NBA league office where it was for 17 years, the NBA was a terribly mismanaged property, more, you know, probably as good at odds that it would go out of business as be successful. And uh, Stern always said, you know, we can't, we just can't dwell on this moment. If we do that, we're, we're going to be nothing but discouraged and, and we won't get to the right place. We got to just focus on what, what the future can be and, and spend every day thinking about if we, if we believe in what that future can be, then every decision we're going to make along the way is going to be focused on that, not on trying to solve an impossible problem that we have right now. And I think, you know, that focus on the future, I guess that's what Hannah and I are trained to do, like in our, in our jobs, it never, we never expected it would look like this, but I think there is hope and, and to stay engaged on thinking about that future and, you know, what steps have to happen to get us there is in some ways it's exhilarating it it opens up a lot of creativity uh channels a lot of energy it keeps you connected with the people that are important in your lives and we have to do all those things i think to get through the crisis that we're going through right now okay rick so you find yourself say at any time now you you're at another pride celebration at the white house president trump comes over to you Mike Pence is with him. They're glad handing everyone. You get your chance to say whatever you want to him. What would you say to him? <laughs> well, uh, I wouldn't be there. As you know, we have <laughs> been uh, specifically disinvited from the White House twice after winning championships because uh, the current administration didn't want our team uh, in the White House. So uh, I, wouldn't, I wouldn't be there. They, they probably didn't want you there because they're so unused to winning. Um, you would intimidate them. John, we're going to be off the air now. Just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> Hannah. <laughs> oh, did you, did you, have the, is there a follow up to Hannah? Sure. Hannah, you're at the white house. What would you, I think you've got something to say to him. No, I, I don't know what I would do in that situation. I can't imagine that I would actually be there. Um, sort of like Rick. So um, I think it would be, hard for me. I mean, it's honestly, it's been really hard for the last four years. Um, just to, when we talk about, you know, having respect for other people and, and I certainly, I, I deeply respect the office of the president and I am very passionate about America and American democracy. And so it, it's very difficult for me. I think you also, Pose this as a hypothetical in which they were having a pride celebration there. And, and that sounds a little far fetched in this little fantasy that you created. Um, and so um, I'm going to, I'm going to have to really think about the, this far fetched and hypothetical world. <laughs> There's a lot for us to deal with in, in this real world that we're living in. Um, so yeah, right. I'll, I'll, 
Okay. Well, before we go, we do have a question from the audience, and this is for you, Rick Welts. It says, Rick Welts, I'm a proud and loyal Warriors fan. Would you mind sharing what you and the Warriors are thinking about for the NBA 2020 draft? <laughs> oh, my goodness. So just between you and us all our really? viewers, yes. Well, uh, as I mentioned before, uh, we have the worst record in the NBA this year. We won 15 games when the season went on hiatus. So we will have an extremely high draft pick uh, this year, somewhere between one and five. So uh, it's going to be interesting. It's, it's, uh, it's not a sure thing who the best player out there is. We have to go through the lottery to see where we pick. And there's always the possibility that you can use that as an asset to try to acquire uh a player that could help your team right away. We think we have about a three-year window with Steph Curry, Clay Thompson, and Draymond Green at their peak uh, to compete for championships right now. So we're going to want we're going to want to either pick a player or get a player in some sort of deal that's going to be able to to help us right now. I think. Hannah, there's going to be a lot of high expectations for the 49ers this oh, year. We're going to the Super Bowl again. <laughs> that's exactly yeah. it. What what can you tell fans to look for it this year? Oh my God! What can you not look forward to after last year? That was just a magic. <laughs> I think we're all just looking forward to getting back to the field um, and watching some football. Like we had a really good time with draft. Um, it was fun to see everybody in their home offices um, and see, you know, some of the new players who are joining the team. But um, a lot more of what you saw last year is, I think, what you can look forward to this year. That's so awesome. So, last, very last question. There's three minutes left, and it's an easy question. But um, it's very easy to be. (laughs) I know the hypothetical question at the White House. (laughs) Um, Well, you know, hey, it's so easy to be a super Bay Area sports fan. And it's because of the community that we've built and the leadership that we're seeing here, you know, on the program. And so leave some last words for the super fans out there um uh that some some words of encouragement and hope we're all going to be together again because i think we all miss the camaraderie the togetherness the family appeal of what sports and our communities can do together we'll start with hannah i got you (laughs) it out with something beautiful um I mean, I guess I would just say first, thank you for sticking with us through this time. Um, Thank you for finding ways to connect, um, whether it's over social media or anything else. Um, Obviously, all of us can't wait to see each other again. And I think, you know, as I was talking about how much I'll appreciate it, I know that all of you are going to be super hyped um, once we're all at games. Um, And even if we're celebrating watching them on our couches, which is what a lot of us do anyways, um, it's another great way to connect. So I would just say like, thank you for being such faithful fans um, through thick and thin. And, um, and we hope to do you proud because you deserve it. Well said, Hannah. So I, you know, I, I hope people look at our organizations and say like in this moment, we rose to the occasion that we did things that we could do to try to contribute to the community at a really crucial time. Um, and we can't wait to get back. You know, I, I think sports has always been uh, an important place to have conversations in our society. It, it is right now. Uh, and we want to make sure that we're part of the recovery and getting back to a normalcy that will make all of our lives better in so many ways. So sports is part of that. We can play a role in that. We're not the most important thing in the world, but but we're additive to the culture of the community. And uh, we can't wait till we can uh, open the doors of Chase Center uh, and welcome our fans back. That's awesome. Well, thank you to Rick Welts of the Warriors and Hannah Gordon of San Francisco 49ers. Uh, Thank you to all of you for joining us. Thank you to the Commonwealth Club and AIDS 2020 for putting the talk together. Don't forget... It is Pride Week, and there are a lot of celebrations happening. It is still Pride. It's still so important for us to be visible and for being together, even if it's virtually. So join us for Global Pride. Uh, We'll be here tomorrow night, Friday at 10 o'clock, which is 5 p.m. on the 27th New Zealand time. We go hour by hour around the world featuring Pride organizations from around the world, world speakers, talent. You can join us at Todrick Hall's YouTube channel. We'll be streaming to his 3.5 million fans and more. Um, So we'll see you there. Happy Pride, and we'll talk to you all soon.